Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, guests, and friends. It was a pleasure to see you all on Zoom, and we thank you so very much for your flexibility with our three virtual meetings upcoming with us putting safety and security as our top priority. Thank you again for being here. Uh, we are very excited about our program today. We will begin with a video of God Bless America, followed by the invocation and four-way test by Molly Riedel. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I hope everybody's comfortable and warm and watching from home or your office or wherever you are. Please join me in a short prayer. Almighty Father, thank you for gathering us together in your name and thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Today we ask you for your guidance and support as we strive to end polio, feed the hungry, educate the illiterate, and clothe the poor. Fill us with your grace as we make decisions that affect our children and those less fortunate than ourselves in our local community and around the world. We seek your help with the tasks before us. Please bless our efforts with clear insight, our deliberations with wisdom, and our work with clarity and accuracy. We ask these things in your name, Almighty Father, amen. And now let us recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Next, we will have a presentation uh, by President-elect Steve King regarding RILA. Steve? Listen to that thunderous applause. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great to see you on Zoom. Happy New Year. I was struck today when I was in the uh, membership committee uh, meeting, I was introducing a new prospective member named Matt Allen. And Matt Allen was a four-year member of the Interact Club at his high school. And as the director in charge of youth services, it warmed my heart to see an Interact, an Interact Club graduate coming home to be a member of our Rotary Club. Interact, Rotaract, UC Rotaract, Four-Way Speech Committee, and RILA are all committees under youth services. Today I wanted to make an announcement and an update around the committee RILA. RILA stands for Rotary Youth Leadership Award. About this time every year we solicit nominations from area high schools to send a few talented young high school sophomores and juniors off to a leadership camp at Camp Kern. That camp is currently scheduled for, for March 18th through the 20th, and Eric Petway and his committee are looking for nominations. Now, the committee is seeking those nominations from area high schools primarily, but he wanted to make a special invitation to solicit invitations and, and nominations for, for high school sophomore and juniors from the Rotary Club itself. So if you have a talented high schooler in your sphere, please pass that name along to Eric or to myself. We'll make sure they get a, a great opportunity to go to this really cool camp where about a hundred students from Southwest Ohio attend uh, a leadership retreat over the course of a weekend where they do ropes courses and climb towers and uh, they listen to speeches and overall learn the skills that is going to lead them to one day be like Matt Allen and come back to us as future Rotarians. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, President-elect Steve. Yes, it was exciting today in the membership uh, committee, classification committee. We had five new prospective members. Uh, Kay Atkins did an outstanding job in covering that meeting as she does as chairperson. Uh, so you'll be meeting five new members hopefully soon. So thank you very much and we're really looking forward to RILA. I was able to speak with our district governor 
Carol Hughes this morning, and she's really excited about all that's going on in District 6670, and uh, she's looking forward to working back with Ryla again once her term finishes as district governor. So thank you so very much to uh, President-elect Steve and the Director over Youth Services. Next, we will have a presentation by uh, one of our new uh, eager members and who is very enthusiastic and exciting, uh, new in her role of uh, chairing the Jefferson Awards Committee. So next, we will have a presentation from Ali Hubbard uh, as she is one of the chairs of the Jefferson Awards Committee. Let's welcome Ali Hubbard. <laughs> Roaring applause, like Stephen said. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I've been invited to give an announcement about the Jefferson Award. Myself and Doug Adams are the chairs of this committee this year. Um, and as many of you know, the Jefferson Award celebrates people in our community who are doing great public and community service without the expectation of recognition or reward. Since 2006, the Rotary Club of Cincinnati has been a local sponsor of the Jefferson Award program. During our 16 years of leading this effort in Cincinnati, we've sent our winners to the annual National Jefferson Award celebration, with nine of them returning as national winners against fierce competition from 90 other communities. Organizations like One in Five, La Soup, the Free Store Food Bank's Rubber Duck Regatta, Crayons to Computers, Lawn Life, and The Cure Starts Now have all been recognized as national winners. Most recently, Last year's winner was our very own Katie Nzekwu from Found Village, whose mission is to empower young people from the greater Cincinnati region to reach their full potential. Now we're asking for your help. The Rotary Club of Cincinnati is again joining our co-sponsors, Local 12 WKRC-TV and the Cincinnati Inquirer to find candidates for the 2022 Jefferson Award. Do you know of a unique program that has impacted our community? Do you know of someone who is doing exceptional community service? If so, please nominate them for this year's award. The deadline to apply is February 11th, and applications are available online. If you have questions or would like additional information, feel free to reach out to myself, Doug Adams, or contact Sarah Pattinson directly. The winner will be announced at our club meeting on March 24th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allie. Great announcement. We'd also like to thank past two-time past governor, district governor, Bill Shula, for his support that he gives to the Jefferson Awards Committee, and thank him for his efforts. Right now, I'm going to go off just a little bit, and I'm going to ask Christy Shushek and Sarah Patterson to please come forward. Just want you to see who our new office staff with our new executive director, Sarah Patterson and Christy, they have worked very, very diligently as we've had to shift to these three meetings to be virtual. There's a lot behind the scenes that nobody gets to see, but I wanted you all to give some special recognition to Christy Shushek and Sarah Patterson for their hard work. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great uh, week and a half with Christy. She's been a rock star, and we've, we've really made things happen, and it's, it's going really well. So thank you, everyone. Yay. Hi, virtual world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very much. Yeah, they've done an outstanding job. Thank you for coming forward. Now we will go to our announcements. We have several members who are celebrating birthdays this week and last week. We have Bob Bowling. Jeff Weir, Jess Hontanosis, Teddy Kramer, Tracy McGuire, Meredith McLean, Andy Magenheim, Drew Emeritt, Arno Rabkin, Esteban Calle, Winston Folkers, Dan Gist, Jeff Dornetti, Jerry Reese, those are birthdays, members who have recently celebrated birthdays or who have uh, birthdays upcoming this week. Let's give them a round of applause for their birthdays. 
please make sure that you continue to read your e-rays. A lot of our updated announcements are in the e-rays. Uh, also, here is some family of Rotary news that's also listed in the e-rays. Rotarian Gary Kendall has informed us that longtime Rotarian bowler Lou Lesher's wife Sally Lesher passed away last week. Please keep the Lesser family in your thoughts and prayers. Please keep past president Rotarian Ron Ott and his family in your thoughts and prayers as they mourn the loss of Ron's wife, Lynn. She died on New Year's Eve. Glenn and Camille Scherzinger, their son-in-law, Chad Taylor, has passed away. Please keep their daughter, Shannon, Glenn and Camille, and the rest of their family, Shannon's two sons, in your thoughts and prayers as well. We also, I also know that uh, Deborah Schultz and Jeff Weir both lost a brother recently. If you could keep Deborah Schultz and Jeff Weir in your thoughts and prayers as well. This is a reminder that we are a Rotary family, and in the family of Rotary is where we place information that you'd like to share, uh, or your thoughts, or if you would like you know, your thoughts and prayers to let a Rotary family know. Please make sure you check with the office and give them the information, and they will be more than glad to list that in the family of Rotary News and the E-Rays. Please make sure that you click on the link. It's not directly on the E-Rays page, but there's a link there that says Family of Rotary News. So please make sure you look at that and so that you would be abreast of what things are going on. Also in the Family of Rotary News is congratulations to Rotarian Wes Botto. Wes and his wife Haley uh, just birthed Dorothy Ann Botto, who was born uh, in December. So congratulations to Wes uh, and Haley on the birth of Dorothy Ann. Also, we have many committee chairpersons who are working on different events coming up next month in February and March. We're really excited about that. Uh, and we also have one major event going on this month. I spoke with Dr. Hux Miller. Actually, he sent me a reminder information about the blood drive that's going on at Hawksworth Blood Center. So please check your notes again, and please uh, go to Hawksworth Blood Center during the blood drive and mention the Rotary Club of Cincinnati if you so choose. Also a reminder that District Governor Carol Hughes sent uh, information regarding the disaster relief information, and some of you have inquired about that. Uh, we're looking forward to moving on with some other ways that we can help in the community when we are back face-to-face -face and in-person. A reminder that our next two weeks will also be virtual, uh, so stay tuned for updates on those meetings. And I would like to thank you for your patience, your flexibility, and your understanding during this time while we've had to shift and make some adjustments. Your support is very appreciated, and thanks to those of you who have called to offer your support and what you can do, whether you're here or whether you're virtual during this time. Next, we will have an introduction to our program today. We're really excited. We have our president nominee, Doug Bolton, who is going to share a few words regarding our program today, after which we will have a video of one of our directors, Mark Romito, uh, introducing the speaker of our program. Doug? Thank, thank you, President Melinda. Um, so, um, whenever a new media person comes to town, um, they tend to either get welcomed or shunned. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, Eric was among the crowd um, when he came to town in 2002, um, that he was welcomed. Um, uh, Eric is a 1997 West Point grad, celebrated uh, veteran. Uh, and has really made a meaningful contribution to this community, um, adding uh, a media voice um, that uh, some say was needed in terms of a, another magazine covering this region, um, and he's done that. Um, but along the way, he's made Cincinnati his home. Um, now it's incredible that he's been here almost 20 years. 
Um, but he's also expanded his footprint uh, into Dayton, creating a magazine in Dayton, creating a magazine in Northern Kentucky, um, now publishing a magazine covering the entire state of Ohio, covering Midwestern travel with a, with a, um, a title named Midwestern Travel, um, and then has also helped some fledgling publications, uh, Cincy Chick, uh, a very niche-oriented publication that uh, now Eric uh, counts himself as, uh, as the publisher and uh, curator of that organization. So um, really, really pleased to have Eric um, uh, join us as a speaker. Um, and with my president-elect hat on, I'm going to do a public appeal, Eric, that um, we would really not shun you if you joined the Rotary Club uh, in the very, very near future and continue your, uh, your great work uh, in the greater Cincinnati region. So let's watch that video. Thank you, President Melinda. Good afternoon. I'm honored to introduce today our featured speaker, Eric Harmon. Eric is the president of Main Street United Media Companies and owner and founder of Cincy Company and Dayton Media Company. But you probably know him better from some of the brands that are under his business umbrella. Brands such as Cincy Magazine, Northern Kentucky Magazine, Dayton Magazine, The Ohio Business Magazine, Midwestern Traveler, and The Chic Guide. Prior to moving to Cincinnati, Eric worked at his family publishing business in Cleveland, Ohio. He is a veteran and decorated officer of the United States Army. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he was a collegiate All-American in rugby. Eric also has a reputation for hosting some of the best networking events in town. His magazines celebrate and recognize business and community leaders at events like the Power 100, the Dayton Business Hall of Fame inductions, the Manny Awards for Manufacturing, and the Nonprofit of the Year Awards. Please welcome Eric Harmon. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, I'm, I'll just assume everybody can hear me okay, but uh, Mark and Doug, uh, much appreciated. And uh, Doug, I, I appreciate not, not being shunned uh, as uh, I, I'm sure most uh, do, but 10 years ago in the news, there was some tough news for the city of Cincinnati and a beloved company, US Playing Card, decided that it was gonna pick up roots and move away. And as the negative news started to flow in, you come to better appreciate that, well, they weren't moving too far away, that they just decided to consolidate their manufacturing efforts and move to Northern Kentucky. So what ended up being a loss for Ohio became Kentucky's gain. And I would say most importantly about U.S. Playing Card is everyone that had a job there had a job when they moved to Kentucky. So this is just one example that I'm very excited to share with you today. And um, what I look at as the heart of our mutual success here in our region is what I deem as selfless regionalism. And what I'm hearing is very similar to this Jefferson Award. But I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak here today. As Doug mentioned, yes, it's been nearly 20 years. Well, my first time at Cincinnati Rotary, I was invited by Dr. Ab Ira Abramson. And um, I met him and he said, what are you doing this afternoon? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, you're coming with me. Um, and uh, when I came to the event, I saw the Rotarians and I saw that you really had to be someone to be a leader amongst this group. And I know it hasn't changed and just have a little fun as I was hearing you uh, during the networking session. So as a part of what Mark had mentioned, I have been a part of a family publishing company and I moved to Cincinnati from Cleveland and my father in the 60s had launched his first magazine and he's had several talks like this and through the years i've talked to them talked to him and he said you know eric talks to organizations like this the format never changes because you're a publisher you're out in the community as doug uh is and you know what you're out talking to senior level decision makers so all you have to do is keep the format the same just 
just can't change the topic. So focused on where we're at, where we've been, and where are we going? And that's what I'm going to do here today. So I'm going to share some thoughts about our community here in the tri-state. And I thought I'd also share a little bit more about what I see happening in local community-based media and possible national media at large. So sprinkled in with these thoughts will be my editorial, uh, which is my op-ed pieces about this mutual success doctrine, this selfless regionalism. So let's get started. So where are we today? And uh, as I was hearing people talk about uh, some things with UC and such uh, in the networking, when we focus on community, one easy thing to talk about is sports, right? And for sports, we are very successful this year. And I'm very excited to say that University of Cincinnati football has just been um, glorious, in my opinion, in terms of how they carried themselves and how far they went into the playoffs. And my opinion is that that effort that University of Cincinnati football did was the best marketing effort that Cincinnati has seen for its city in the last 20 years. And I'm going to share with you a reason why I think that. Four or five years ago, UC football was just starting to get good. And they had one of their first national televised games. And I'm not really, I don't really remember who they were playing. But we woke up the next morning, came to the office, a circulation director for the magazines came to me and said, Eric, what's the deal? We had this rapid fire amount of complimentary subscriptions that came in last night. And lo and behold, we come to figure out, we tied it to... UC football in that it was a televised game on the sports ticker through ESPN. I think it was UCF had UCF versus Cincy C I N C Y. So we were really ecstatic to hear of that, that they're taking on this Cincy name that we had as herself uh, for the magazine. But what happened was this is nationally televised. People were excited to learn more about Cincinnati so they Googled what they saw, Cincy, and there, I'm sure, close to it was Cincy Magazine, and we're a complimentary subscription. So there's the connect that these sports have for our community. And I'll just give one other sports example that I'm, as I imagine many are, very proud of FC Cincinnati and what they've accomplished recently. And if you look at that stadium, you walk it around, that to me, that is a showpiece for our city. And if you look at the ownership group, how they did it, how quickly they became a part of the MLS, uh, it's really stunning. Well, as you go through in reference to this, how, you, how does this work for our region? I originally was concerned, not about having soccer come to town, but could this hurt our beloved Reds, right? Because the two schedules actually overlap each other a good deal. And um, as I figured it out, I decided, okay, I'm going to go and look at how we've done in terms of total attendance. So the Reds in 2019, their average attendance amongst other teams, they ranked 19th. And so I think that's pretty good uh, amongst some 30 teams. Well, fast forward to 2021, minus COVID year, they became 17th. So they improved two marks against two other teams in terms of a total attendance. So this is obviously happening while FC was playing their games. And from my perspective, when you think of how it could have played out versus how it played out, the Castellinis, the Reds ownership were nothing but gracious to welcome in MLS soccer into Cincinnati. So it was everyone's game to have this in place. And of course, everybody, uh, one in total attendance. Uh, more about today, if you look at our city at large, uh, we are ranked 30th as compared to other MSAs or what we call metropolitan statistical areas. And in the past census, we grew between 2010 to 2020 by 6%. And that to me is very positive. Because I want to be a part of growth. Um, 
And I think in, a, in the current time frame, I think we should all be proud of that. So keep in mind in terms of those top 30 MSAs, 23 of the MSAs grew at a more rapid clip than did Cincinnati. However, something very, very important is that Cincinnati grew at a faster clip than both Cleveland and Pittsburgh. If this wasn't Zoom, I'm thinking I'm getting a roar of applause right now. Um, but I'll tell you, that to me, even as a Clevelander, made me proud. But as a tri-state, I do believe we demonstrate value in how we represent three states. And I'm sure your family is like mine, that we like to go out to eat uh, when we can. We like to go to places we like, but we also like to go to new places. And I think this is what a tri-state brings to the table when you talk about where you can live, where you can place your business, what business associations that you can participate in. Okay, in terms of the current state of affairs, there is a new mayor uh, here in town. Unfortunately, he's got same COVID, right? We've got this issue that we have to deal with. And for uh, today's urban centers that had this workforce as the lifeblood of who they are, for COVID to be able to uh, really affect that, that's obviously happening downtown, we all see it. But what we're excited about as you get any time with newly elected officials, new CEOs, there is great aspirations. And I'm seeing that playing out here in Cincinnati. Um, so good energy, excited to see what they can do. As it applies to media, so current state of affairs, there's no doubt that digital first is becoming uh, a big part of our day. And everybody knows about Facebook. They know about Google. And they have transformed our landscape so dramatically, so quickly. And everybody first saw how print newspapers were um, starting to take a, a hit. You might have read today in the Inquirer that they just made the announcement that they're going from seven days a week to six days a week. So that's official uh, now. And it's something that uh, we're not excited about because I know that they serve a real purpose. But have no doubt, currently, TV, radio, billboards, when you're talking about the media business, we're all facing this change of audience interest. And it's a question of where this audience is spending their time. City regional magazines have had a rich history. Um, we fortunately have not seen such declines in terms of audience. Um, and in fact, we've grown in print subscribers only because our digital audience has been enabled us to reach more audiences. Well, how, however, one thing that is different is advertising dollars. They clearly point towards the direction of digital and how do all media outlets engage with digital? And uh, for us on a local community-based level, Mark had mentioned the different events that we have, those afford us to be able to cultivate audiences. Um, and so that's definitely gonna be uh, here and definitely will be part of our future. But also social media is such the big thing now, right? So whatever is hot is, is very much in place. But with all these changes digitally for media, the one thing I'd point out is, is that bigger doesn't always mean better. And it's how we can adapt. So small businesses like ours, locally owned, that's to our advantages. So that's what we're here for today. And I'm gonna jump into where uh, have we been? And of course, there's no one better than someone from Cleveland to tell Cincinnati's history, correct? Um, but um, I'll tell you, when I moved to Cincinnati, what you can tell is its history provides real texture and that presents itself in its current form in many ways. But that rich tradition of businesses, when you're talking about your P&Gs and your Western and Southerns and your Fifth Thirds, they have all defined our skylines and very much our way of life. And all of this, most of it, has emanated originally from our downtown core. We did a story on John Barrett from Western Southern when they were building the Queen City Tower. He was asked, 
John, why build the tallest building in Cincinnati? And his response quick was, why not? I loved that response, but of course, so do my kids because it is their favorite building that they point out when they drive downtown. Um, but for us, we all benefit as a result of that mindset. Um, there's nothing new here in terms of what I would say, uh, where we've been in terms of education resources. Cincinnati is really unique, in my opinion, about how much we have in this arena. UC in particular, uh, with its co-op programs, I found to be uh, very interesting in terms of how local businesses have in the past connected with students, which will become their future employees. I also saw that Cincinnati is a very loyal town. Um, I remember, uh, or I suppose that uh, the basketball team was called the Royals. I think it should have been the Loyals because Cincinnati has certain things that they really, um, you know, are bound to. And one of those is the arts. Another, you could say, would be the Reds. This is definitely a baseball town, and it's really unique in that factor. But things like the zoo are very unprecedented. So um, in terms of community-based media, we have been in the past focused on driving connections with our audience to its city and how we draw in the arts, the business, and the culture. Uh, but we could also in the past recognize that we played a secondary role when it comes to hard-hitting journalism, uh, leadership, as what I saw, uh, Doug, very appropriate for you to, to discuss, you know, these thoughts is that uh, news, outs, news, news outlets like the daily, the weekly papers, they have always carried that leadership role, sometimes TV, even radio, which uh, Cincinnati is also one of those big radio towns. So if we had a crystal ball, let's take a look into our future. So when it focuses on community, that there is definitely going to be, in my opinion, a strong push for amenities that are close to home. Larger cities will have to take a look at how they had originally this corporate real estate tenant group that drove things. They are going to have to quickly transform themselves to create unique value sets for their customers. And according to the New York Times, the nation's most urban counties for the second year in a row have reduced in population. I think that's pretty important to recognize. And in my view, in the future, COVID stays with us, right? Some variant is always going to be here. If it's not one, it's going to be the other. But in many ways, it does go away. So what we're here together today experimentation with zoom i think what we got it in about five or ten minutes right this technology didn't even exist in my mind three or four years ago so it's very much i think going to be a part of our future and if uh those uh, that are working within companies that are training people you could recognize now that it's become a great what the old military term would be combat multiplier so we're doing that and using it a lot. And I think that's going to be very much a part of the future. Now, how does COVID go away? So we're all very excited. I don't know if you saw also in today's inquiry, they talked about uh, the ARC turning orange in support of prayers for the Bengals on Saturday, which is um, pretty cool. I wonder how they did that. But there's not going to be a seat to be had at that stadium Saturday afternoon during COVID. Right. We're all going to be there at 65,000 strong. Oh, I don't know how many it is, but it's a lot. Right. So there's an example of where COVID does start to transfer away. There is going to be a growth in the suburban city's influence, and they're going to be able to build infrastructure. Those that are more accessible communities will start to win out. And as what we've seen working remotely, it just does frankly work. People like it. So I definitely see that as a part of our future. But the big part I would say here is, is that Cincinnati can demonstrate this in terms of comparably to bigger cities. We can win here. According to the New York Times as well, domestic migration, what is the greatest population change metric is when somebody moves, say, from Indiana 
from the farms. They want to go to the big city in Cincinnati. Okay. It's population change domestically. The same thing happens if somebody grows up here in Cincinnati and decides, you know what, I want to go to a cool town for a couple of years. I want to go to Nashville. I want to go to Austin. So it's, you know, nothing new that we compete. And the chambers know this, uh, different, those that are attracting people to the area. In my view, where uh, we definitely compete for talent, but I personally believe where we can compete the best is recognizing people think of their futures not in one or two year increments. They think in five and 10. What is this going to mean for my family? That's where Cincinnati can really win. As we uh, talked about uh, the media in terms of the future, um, what is old becomes new. An example of this, Scripps Howard, their first newspaper was in Cleveland. Um, but most news organizations originally started as locally owned entities as a part of whatever city they were in. And in my view, where media goes is that the, the big ones only get bigger, but the small ones serve its communities by having local ownership in some way, shape, or form. And by demonstrating local ownership affords the individuals to be able to take a leadership stance in their communities that we mentioned before wasn't as much as a part of what community-based media could do. But one of the things that everybody's looking for in terms of media is not just looking for what can sustain us, but what affords us to grow as compared to some of these big public companies. Uh, Main Street United is a new brand for us, but was created based upon the, the title of Main Street here in Cincinnati. Uh, we were launched out of Main Street Ventures, but for us, um, the effort we can see is, is that our mission is different than we were before and that we have to afford others to grow their business in the towns which they live. So lastly, more about the selfless regionalism, um, just to give you some examples or to evaluate on, but my personal belief is that we need to afford multiple voices and passions to coexist. That just like when you're looking at the Reds, that they didn't have to be originally the direct beneficiary to look at the cause, look at the agenda, you don't have to seek to rush to dismiss the benefits that something can provide. I'm also a big believer, as Doug mentioned, having more organizations, one organization should not own a narrative for our city. That if we are singing the same tune, the more voices, the greater the volume. But we all win today, just like in business, that Cincinnati has to recognize that as a part of these changes, we must be agile because it's very important to note the chess pieces are now moving. Lastly, um, I did take a look at U.S. playing card. So we cited that in the beginning of them moving to Kentucky. They are still growing there in other Kentucky. They're currently advertising 17 available positions that they're looking to fill. Thank you. So I don't know if we have any time yet. We may not have much more time, but for questions, but I can take a look here, but I'll let the, I'll let the. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for that great presentation regarding media and updates. Since we are on Zoom, if you could check and see if there are any questions in the chat, I just checked my phone and there were not any uh, any questions listed texted to me via phone. So perhaps we could take the questions via Zoom. If there are any questions uh, that they could ask to you or either put in your chat. While we're waiting for that, Jeff, we have one question from President-elect Steve King. And that question is, what, Steve? What's your prognosis for the Brent Spence Bridge? <laughs> yeah, well, boy, we're talking about crystal balls. Um, you know, that's, uh, 
They, I, someone just told me that it's no fun to watch sausage being made, right? And that's up at John Morrell plant up by Tri-County. It's the same way when you're trying to look at it at Brent Spence Bridge. Um, I, I think uh, for all interested, uh, we're trying to figure out what that could mean. And I, I'd keep close, so I don't have your answer for you, but Mark Polisinski at OKI, I think probably is the best person that I know of that would be able to tell you what is the real scoop. Um, but I, I do see a lot of collaboration happening with having the separate brand of Know the Kentucky Magazine. It is interesting to take a look at these issues from different lenses. What I saw 10 years ago in reference to Brent Spence Bridge uh, as it related towards those in Northern Kentucky and Ohio, I think that is changing as um, the um, how the bridge was down, all the construction they had to go through over the last year. I think people are recognizing what could be the future if things aren't done. Thank you very much, Eric, for that question. Are there any other questions from those on Zoom? Okay, if not, then thank you again, Eric. There is one? Okay. No, I can't. Okay. We're going to have, uh, Doug Bolton is going to, to tell us this question that's listed. Here you go, Doug. So Eric, you can probably see that, but it's uh, what do you see as the number one issue facing the tri-state? Yeah, well, I, I think that um, uh, that is a great question. And from you know a media's perspective, um, we might take it differently, but also as a business owner, I take it from a different perspective than um, what I always say is, is if you find a good journalist, let me know, because I, I know them and they're not me because uh, they have something of a great skill set. But when I look at it from a business owner's perspective is the climate of where business can be afforded the opportunity to grow. And, and it's not taxes and things like that. And in my view, it's about enabling small business owners to grow their business. And I can look back and just being given a loan, for instance, uh, or granted from uh, Hamilton County Development Center as a part of the federal funds, that's a huge win for a business like ours. That means that that's going directly into salaries. I look at it from the PPP one and PPP two, that went directly into salaries. So if my mindset reference to the tri-state is, can we keep that small business owner, that business that's looking to grow in mind with all the other things and challenges that we have. So that's where I would be coming from is the hope that uh, the biggest issue is keeping the focus on allowing our businesses to grow rather than everything else. So Eric, uh, this question is not on the, in the Zoom, but I'll, I'll ask it. Can you, can you touch on, you, you talked about how the Enquirer has gone from, uh, is going to be going from seven days to six days. Um, do you see uh, print uh, existing in your lifetime in, uh, or, or do you think we're gonna we're gonna go to digital all, all digital uh, eventually? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to answer that because um, you know I am 47, so I started in the business in my later 20s, and at some point in time in my mid 30s, talking to my fiance uh, became my wife. Eric, is this the business you want to be in? Which at that time we were a magazine print publishing business, and so as we've evolved of course that we've talked about growing into these different avenues but yes i do believe print is very much a part of the offerings because it offers a unique value set now does it provide the same comparatively to what used to be which i still get the daily paper i still get the wall street journal today but that's me the great majority of my generation is not doing the daily paper delivery so i think that will change in terms of print overall. But for magazines, it is a leisure activity. We're giving people the uh, fun things that are happening in their community. And yes, that can happen digitally, but I very much think print will be a part of our future. And there is nothing in my view on a local basis better to brand a business than what could be uh, a print opportunity. So great question from Cheryl Parker. Um, so talk about social media uh, and how that impacts news organizations, uh, media organizations like yourself. 
Yeah. Yeah. Social media has been a, a great way to communicate for businesses of all sorts, media included. Um, what I've noticed is, is that those that were journalists that didn't like to be involved with social media, they aren't working full time for their organizations anymore just because they have to be a part of that mix. Um, and it's because it is where people are spending their time. So I am excited for what social media can deliver. Um, but mind you, my children, my oldest is 12, does not have a phone yet. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> and it's because I don't think that, well, we as a couple don't think that's good for them, the social media and we think that's greater negatives than positives currently. So I think it provides value and, um, what what I am excited to see is is that it gives those that didn't have a voice more of an opportunity to reach out, and that goes back to you know the talk of just more voices. Um, so if Cincinnati uh, can embrace that, um, I think all for the better. So here's another tough question, Eric. Um, Cincinnati has one of the highest poverty rates in the country. What can the media do to help alleviate? that issue? Boy, um, that is a tough question. Um, because I, I don't think that if I had the ready answer, um, I wish I did. But uh, there is real issues when it comes to that. And we've had Power 100 seminars or, or series on this. And uh, what I hope is, is that as someone like being um, a local owner is most bought into that specific city. I feel the tug when I, when we got involved with other markets to ask myself, what is this for the business or is this for say Cincinnati or say Dayton? And I feel that what we can do is best enable ourselves to have the passion be connected on a local level. And that's to have local ownership because that will continue this path forward for people to put in the blood, sweat, and tears that needs to happen to change results. So Melinda, I don't see any more questions, so I think we're good. Thank you very much, Doug, and thank you again, Eric. Thank you very much for giving us the update on media where we were, where we're going, some projections, being visionary, talking about digital media changing. We're actually in the process of that right now, making uh, transformational changes with our meetings. As you said, several years ago, we would not have had the opportunity to be able to meet here via Zoom. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Thank you again for your speech. And as a result of your presentation today, we will be making a contribution to Rotary International for the eradication of polio and those efforts. We also have a pin for you that we will present to you a little later that has our motto on for this year for Rotary, serve to change lives. And again, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, it was a great presentation to have. Although it was virtual, it was very well received and very well done and we thank you again. I'd also like to thank the staff again for changes and the last minute uh, ad adjustments that had to be made for us to actually be here today with this meeting. So thanks again to the staff, uh, to the executive team. Uh, there have been a lot of things going on lately and the executive team members have been meeting. President Brett, who's in Florida, thanks to him. President-elect Steve King and President nominee Doug Bolton, thanks to you. We have one meeting this afternoon following this meeting, and that will be our board meeting. It will be virtual as well. So at about 1.30, we will be meeting on Zoom as a board. Thanks again to all of you. Please feel free to continue to reach out to me. Thank you, Rotarians of the Rotary Club of Cincinnati, for your transparency. Some of you are experiencing some pretty rough times, and we are here for you. So continue to reach out to me and the board members as well. 
So please stay safe, healthy, and well, and we look forward to seeing you again virtually on next week. Meeting adjourned.